Howdy y'all. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about our presidential candidates and their wanting to represent martial strength uh, and to show off their knowledge of the military. And in so doing, events to me at least, that uh, most of them don't know what they're talking about very much at all. So, um, just out of the gate here, I don't expect generally <clears throat> for presidential candidates to be military scholars. I don't expect them to have a great deal of experience or any experience at all with military planning. I don't expect them to be experts, but I do expect them, a person who wants to walk around talking about, I'll be commander-in-chief of the most powerful military in the world, to at least be casually conversant in things martial. In other words, I don't expect that any of them uh, would, uh, would walk into a war room somewhere and... Uh, And, and know right away that, on this Maku, that that right there is a battalion of self-propelled howitzers any more than I would expect them to know that, uh... that this represents a plan to have, uh, some infantry. We'll make them mechanized. We'll make them armored, actually. Wheeled infantry. Uh, we'll give them a gun system. We'll say that they're a platoon sized task force reinforced <laughs> That's the funny part. On bicycles. I don't expect any of them to be able to do anything like that. I don't expect them to have, have knowledge of military planning. But when you don't have knowledge of these things, what you should do is not try to speak as though you do. Uh, the, pre the candidate doesn't want to have to, answer, uh, have to uh, answer when asked, what would you do about this? To say, well, I would turn to my general and say, general, what should I do? And then I would listen to that general and listen to another general, and the guy, I agree with one of you generals. Because you want some independent decision-making there, so these people want to make it out to be like they would be making independent decisions. Uh, but when they do that, they show that they don't have the knowledge to be making independent decisions. <clears throat> I fully agree, by the way, that the, uh, what a president should do is seek his military advisors, make sure you get the best people in the job uh, to be your advisors, and uh, if and when war comes, you take their advice about how it will be prosecuted. Uh, the decision to go in or not is uh, divided between the President and the Congress, and they need to s solve that on the political front. But once it's decided there's going to be military action, uh, the President should look at the General and say uh, something substantially in the form of, uh, General Fluffy, on this map here, you see this, uh, this big circle? Uh, go own that shit for us. Go there and conquer. Do everything that is necessary to conquer, I will give you whatever you want. And then the president's job, with respect to that from now on, is, well, until, until it ends, is to stand up and uh, talk to everyone else and say, um, you know, when criticism comes, look, it's war. What the hell did you expect? What the hell did you expect? Uh, every candidate wants to talk about Obama's, uh, I'm to all the Republican candidates, want to talk about Obama's uh, photo op, foreign policy, his, his PR whirlwind of military campaigns. That's all any of them have, is, is a discussion about photo op, foreign policy, and uh, PR spending for uh, various military engagements. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, and this is what happens when you elect people who don't know anything about the military and who are concerned um, about two incompatible goals, you know, having good PR and engaging in military campaigns. Those two are not reconcilable. If you're going to engage in a military campaign, you're going to get a lot of really bad shit happening, and you better be prepared to, to go to the mat protecting your troops for all of it, because you're the one who ordered them to go in. And if you can't stand up and take the political heat for all the bad things that are going to happen in a war, which is going to be evil, I mean, what do you think war is? Uh, then you certainly, in my estimation, don't have any claim of right to be thought of as a person who deserves to command men in battle. You're not even brave enough to deal with the bad PR. Um, and I'll give you an example. George Bush... In, uh, so in 2004, you may, in 2003, you may remember we invaded Iraq, and in 2004, I think, I think it was 2004, um, there was a political, uh, a public relations, a public relations nightmare that happened, and uh, a mosque was uh, bombed. I don't know if it was one of ours. I don't remember the details of how it got bombed, but it doesn't matter for my purposes. 
a, a mosque was blown up. And there were dead people all over the place. It was blamed on the Americans, whether we did it or not, I don't know, don't care, uh, for purposes of this argument. And what happened was the Bush administration in, uh, engaged in what was called a unilateral ceasefire. If you don't know what that means, I'll translate. We stop shooting, but our enemy doesn't stop shooting. He, through you know, the Bush administration, ordered American servicemen to not defend themselves. So we had soldiers not looking for cover for to get an advantageous position to shoot from, but just running from place to protect themselves, to place to protect themselves, to place to protect themselves, because they were not permitted uh, to return fire if it would incur mili uh, civilian casualties. That is about as close as, as a, that betrayal is of such type that it is about as close as you can come to committing treason without actually committing treason, in my view. Not a peep. Remember Lindsey Graham getting up, I know, uh, give me George Bush, I know he made some mistakes, but he was great, I want him back. You can keep him, sir. <clears throat> anyway, um, so these people, when they don't know anything, they will represent, I'm strength, I've got balls, no, don't push the U.S. around, this kind of stuff. It's really frustrating. So, I like the idea of, of a person who wants to be commander-in-chief, who uh, has two goals with respect to the military, and, and, and combat, I mean. Uh, one, that he's going to move heaven and earth to avoid it, do everything that you possibly reasonably can do in order to avoid armed conflict. However, if and when armed conflict does need to uh, be engaged in, to look at the generals and tell them, go there and win. So that's Ted Cruz's popularity on that front. That you know, his his big talking point that people really love, and I love it too, is that our soldiers will not fight with one hand tied behind their backs, which is precisely how you need to fight a war in order to win it. And if you're not prepared to make that decision, to tell them that you will, general, if in your military judgment you need to engage in whatever, uh, do it. Now, one of the difficulties in, in the conversation about war, the so-called war crimes. The notion being that we can bring civility and reason to what is inherently an uncivil and unreasonable activity. War is not about morality. War is not about who is right and who is wrong. War is about who wins. Who, at the end of the day, is still alive. The Nazis could have won uh, World War II. The world would not have been a better place for their having won, though it is a better place for their having lost. You get no guarantees, no promise of a brighter tomorrow, and it is uh, every military engagement is a concession to the limitation of our species to be reasonable. Nevertheless, once you're involved in a chaotic situation like that, you can make better and worse decisions. Uh, and we seem to uh, forget some of the lessons of history. I'll give you an example. In World War I, uh, between World War I and World War II, Churchill was a big protagonist of the idea of uh, just air bombings, that they would be uh, what we would call precision bombings today. Uh, we'll only do this, we'll only do that, we'll only do the other, if and when we ever need to be in war again. Uh, got in a war again, and uh, he quickly realized, through the deaths of many of their service members, that when you have two sides in a war, and one of them won't uh, one of them will do everything that's necessary to win, and one of them won't do everything that's necessary to win. The victor is going to be, most likely, the person who will do everything it takes to win. And <clears throat> so Churchill reversed his position for all the obvious reasons. The, you would have lost. Uh, the United States learned nothing from this. We go into the war. FDR and Eisenhower wanted to try the same failed strategy of a friendly war. You know, we love civilians. We'll do everything we can to avoid this and do that. And... We won't do raids here, we won't do raids there, and, and they realize through the deaths of many hundreds and thousands of American service members that you cannot fight a war with one hand tied behind your back when your enemy is tying nothing, when your enemy is not going to avoid doing anything uh, that is uh, advantageous to it to win. When, uh, I can't remember the British commander now, I think it was Bomber Harris, but it might have been someone else who said, uh, in, uh, by his lights, in this talk about war crimes, the only crime in war is engaging in activity that is not calculated to winning the war. Uh, so when you, for example, you want to talk about rape. Raping people does not help you win wars. Uh, senselessly slaughtering civilians does not win you wars. Uh, but taking out an industrial center that happens to have a lot of civilians does win you, can win you wars. Now, on to um, the Ted Cruz 
uh, carpet bombing, it, whatever the hell he's dreaming of. So when I heard him say this, he said he would, uh, if, he would like to see if the sand will glow in the dark, he's going to carpet bomb. Now, uh, carpet bombing, uh, a type of strategic bombing, is not worried about the, the fine details of what's in and what's out. So when he said he would carpet bomb if necessary to win, I thought, well, it can be a militarily advantageous strategy to engage in. Uh, okay. And then he said, but what he would do is have special forces troops directing the fire and saying, here yes, there no, uh, here are the troops. Anyway, so one of the questions he was asked was, uh, would you give the order to carpet bomb, say, Raqqa? And he goes, oh, no, it's not the cities that you carpet bomb. You, you carpet bomb where ISIS is. And he said the, the object. So he's speaking the language of, of a treaty. The object of the military engagement being the people fighting, the belligerents, not, not the property around them and not the people around them. Well, the problem is, is that you, he's trying to marry together two incompatible uh, notions. Um, so you, uh, you need to think about the military, military engagements op, uh, happening at three broad levels uh, in generality. You have the strategic level, the operational level, and the tactical level. The strategic level is very general, you know, like, go, oh, go there and win. At the end of the day, we want to be the winners, not the losers. Uh, here, here's your big army, that kind of, very, very general. This is where the, the politicians are involved in it. Uh, this is trying diplomatic measures, economic measures, all, all kinds of different things in very general ways to try to encourage people on the other side not to, not to engage in war with you. Uh, so you'll have whatever the strategic goals are, and then you'll have the operational level right below that. So now we're not at the top level of generals and politicians. You're at the middle level of generals and you know, uh, colonels. And um, they engage in decisions that uh, over give overarching tasks, subtasks, if you will, to tactical commanders. So these are subordinate commanders who will be tasked with a big, a big slice of the strategy and then they have to allocate their resources, at, uh, to, you know, give it down to the tactical commanders to make the decisions about the particular conduct. The tactical level is, this is down to the man. How much food do you need to carry today for this patrol? Uh, how many, if this happens, Private Smith, your job is this. Private Frank, your job is that. Corporal so-and-so, your team will do this. Sergeant so-and-so, your team will do that. This is down to the man. The time, how many people, the precise number of people you're going to take. So it's not general goals. These are the specific goals. Take that hill. That kind of stuff. It's actually more precise than that, actually. Take, we're, the goal here is to take this hill, and uh, first platoon's going here, first, second platoon's going to come up this way, whatever it is. Very detailed. The complete opposite of the, uh, the, the strategic level. Well, when you're talking about strategic bombing, of which carpet bombing is a subspecies, you aren't trying to take out any current military uh, militarily advantageous target at the, at the moment. You're not, taking, you're not interested in the fine details because you're engaging this not because it's going to be useful today, but because over the fullness of time, the, uh, these subtle effects, or not so subtle effects, will, will build up and make it more and more difficult for your enemy to keep fighting. This is part of bleeding someone white. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two examples with a fuel truck. If uh, a tactical uh, a tactical target for bombing would be something like a particular fuel truck. There is uh, this battalion's two fuel trucks. Bomb that. Uh, get the tanks if you can, because if you take out their uh, the fuel they need today, you have taken a, a military asset out of the game today. If you go find, they've kept all their uh, oil reserves, their petroleum reserves in one spot, say they were stupid and you find out where it is, and you, you take out all of their reserves, you've done nothing for any battle that's happening at the moment, and you've done nothing for any battle that's going to happen tomorrow. You've done nothing in the immediate term, because all the, uh, the supplies uh, for a certain, number, a certain amount of time in advance have already been given out to the different units. They've already been dispersed among the force, so they still have that. Even though their, their petroleum reserves won't dry, you know, say, in six months they'll have exhausted everything. They don't need to worry about that right away because they can still prosecute the war. They can still do the fighting today because they already had the supplies necessary to continue their efforts at the moment. So, a strategic thing would be, okay, um, here is this, this area. It is an industrial center, a manufacturing center, an economic center, something like that. And uh, what we're going to do, because we can't pick out this and we can't pick out that, we're going to level every fucking thing. So, uh, 
we'll have all these uh, sorties are going to be flown. The first set are going to drop their bombs in this general area. The second set's going to drop their bombs in this particular in this general area, and so on. And then you just blanket the place and bomb. You try to get the, everything in there just reduced to rubble. And you don't worry about is the you know is that house here is that a safe house or a politician's house is that a commander? You don't care. You're not interested in the details. You're interested in weakening, weakening their infrastructure, severing communication lines, severing uh, their artillery, art, uh, artillery, or oh my God, arterial uh, roadways, their economic systems, food, whatever it is, demoralizing all these kinds of things. That's the purpose there. It, it isn't because if we bomb here today, they're going to go, oh, we quit. You took out our army. It isn't that. So that's what he's talking about when he mentions carpet bombing. Uh, but then he talks about that in a tactical sense, which is it's just gibberish. <clears throat> now on to the issue of uh, t Ted Cruz supposedly wanting to engage in war crimes. Um, and people will cite to the Geneva Conventions. There is a small problem with this argument, namely in that the uh, indiscriminate, bombing of, indiscriminate bombing of civilians is not... Um, prohibited by the Geneva Conventions themselves, there is something called the additional, or protocol additional to the Geneva Convention that deals with um, with this particular issue. And the United States is not a signatory. Well, we are a signatory. We're not a party to those protocols. We didn't join that, uh, that update to the Geneva Conventions, though we are signatories. We signed it with a reservation that we do not understand the indiscriminate killing of civilians or civilian populations to include a restriction on the use of weapons of mass destruction, for example. Uh, <clears throat> a very indiscriminate bomb. And the other reservation, I guess the guy who we sent there was not a plenipotentiary. Actually, I guess that's true. Whenever we send, uh, even when the president goes to negotiate a treaty, he's not a plenipotentiary because it requires the uh, approval of the Senate. And these particular protocols were never sent to the Senate and therefore never ratified, and therefore they are not treaties of the United States, and therefore they are not part of our law. Uh, the most that we have agreed to do with respect to uh, our having signed these additional protocols is to try to make a good faith effort to avoid indiscriminately killing civilians, which of course we do. The issue there, though, is the nature of war. Um, ethics are great, they're wonderful, it's fine to have ethics, until you're in situations where the question, is this ethical or is this not ethical, doesn't even seem to get to have any purchase. For example, if Hitler surrounded himself every day with 100,000 newborn babies, and you couldn't tell which of those 100,000 one persons was Hitler, you drop the bomb and kill them all. To guarantee you kill, you overbomb in order to make sure you definitely get the target that you want. In this case, Hitler. Now, of course, that sounds absolutely horrible. You have just killed 100,000 newborns. Well, if you'd done that at the beginning of the war, killing that 100,000 people would have spared the following 80 million or 70 million or however many millions of people it was that, that came in the wake. <clears throat> now, we try to not engage in that kind of war uh, because it, it really it really does fuck with soldiers to have to do that, at least American soldiers and our allies, some other people not so much. By the way, sometimes we fight enemies who uh, <clears throat> they measure success by how many civilians they kill and we measure by how few. We are one of the very few countries in the world that when we're engaged in various campaigns, we go out of our way to warn civilians when we're going to be operating in their area uh, so that way they can escape. And uh, often we will give them instructions on where they can go to guarantee that we won't kill them, that they won't be killed by our bombs. Now, you can call that terrorism if you want because it will scare them. I mean, if I'm told that there is a bomber heading to my house right now and about to blow me up. And it's probably going to scare me, but it isn't terrorism. The goal there is not to intimidate and it's not to frighten. It's to give them the opportunity to save their own lives by letting them unass the AO. Uh, go look at the bombing of Monte Cassino. German uh, n Nazis, in this case, uh, were up there using it as an observation post to call in uh, artillery and whatnot and airstrikes against Allied forces during World War II. Commanders tried very hard to avoid having to bomb Monte Cassino, the ancient monastery. And finally they said, we can't do this anymore. So they uh, put leaflets in an artillery piece, shot it over, it blew up in the air, however this works. Uh, they flittered down and it had an, an Italian and English saying, we've been trying very hard. Uh, you'll notice we've not bombed your monastery, but we can no longer do that because of this, that, and the other reason. And uh, you are, uh, it is in your best interest to leave because if you remain, you will be dead by the end of the day. Have a good day. Uh, we did this in Korea. 
we've World War II. I mean, we do this a lot. We really do try to get it out to the civilian populations uh, that we don't want to kill them, and if they leave, we will leave them alone. They're not who we're after. Uh, some of them don't believe it. They'll just stay there and they get blown up. We had uh, airmen come back from bombing raids in World War II covered in vomit. I'm sorry, in, in, uh, say in Korea. Covered, covered in, in vomit. Not because they were dogfighting and you know they just weren't used to it or they couldn't handle the G's or whatever. They were bombers, you know, slow flying, high drop bombs. It's because they knew what was happening when they released those bombs. They were killing thousands, incinerating thousands of innocent uh, children, innocent women, and innocent men. People who did nothing wrong to anybody, don't deserve any of this, uh, don't want to be involved in it, but can't go anywhere. But they did their duty. This is one of the reasons that I, I don't like euphemisms to talk about the bad consequences that happen in war. We do not collaterally damage children when we blow them up. We kill them. We do not collaterally damage women when we blow them up. We kill them. We do not collaterally damage innocent men in war when we drop bombs. We slaughter them. And this whole wanting to sanitize the conversation about war so that way we can avoid having to confront the real reality of what goes on in the war is a way that allows us to feel somewhat better about being involved in a war, which is less of an impediment to our getting involved in things that should be called war, but that we've developed other terms to speak about. A police action, a nation building, a police act, these kinds of things. They're conflict, they're armed conflict. We are going to kill innocent civilians when we engage in armed conflict. The that war is terrible is the reason to avoid it at all costs. I don't want a, I want a president who does two things. One, moves heaven and earth to avoid armed conflict. If it is not necessary to fight this war, in my view, it is necessary not to fight this war. However, if and when it becomes necessary to fight this war, it, it all but can't be avoided. I want a commander-in-chief who will look at the general and say, go there and win. Whatever it takes, go do it. From here on out, my job is to stand up and protect you and to take the political heat off of you. You don't worry about anything but making military decisions. Don't worry about how this plays in the press. Don't. Your job is to fight and win this nation's wars. Your job is to make sure those people die for their country, not so that way our people aren't having to die for ours. Go there and win. Uh, so I like that when Ted Cruz says something like that, but I don't like the fact that when, when he's asked about making things glow in the dark from these bombing campaigns, that he gets this shit-eating smirk on his face. Innocent men, women, and children are going to be incinerated in these bomb, in these bombing runs. It might be necessary to do it to win, but fuck, don't be happy about it. Don't be, don't, oh, yeah, I'd do that. You should never take any pride in A, that you had to get involved in a war, and B, the things that you have to do in a war. It is always horrible. It is terrible. And the idea that he'd be smiling talking about incinerating, blowing up innocent children and innocent women and innocent men really annoys me. That is not a good thing to be in. I don't want a warmonger. I want someone who's not a coward and who will win necessary fight, but who will also try to avoid that fight. And if and when uh, things have failed to such an extent that the only option left is war, that he goes into it uh, reluctantly at first, but full-throated uh, full, uh, full defense when it uh, comes time to fight that war. It is simply not something that should be optional. And as I said, if it is not necessary to fight the war, I think it is, or if it's not all but necessary to fight the war, it is necessary to not fight that war. Um, but if, and I'm not, I'm not saying apologize for having to engage in militarily advantageous uh, conduct that is reasonably calculated to aid in the, in the winning of the war, um, because if it has to be done, it has to be done, and you shouldn't uh, not do it simply because, but don't be happy about it. Have a good day.